Once considered equal to Homer, the 7th century BC poetess Sappho is now almost completely unknown. But who was she? Why was she so controversial? And what exactly happened to her poetry? Hello, my name is Anya Leonard, and you are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I will be discussing the ancient Greek poetess Sappho. But before I do, I'd like to mention that my children's book Sappho, The Lost Poetess, is now available both as a hardback and ebook. It delves into her life, work, and loss, as well as the remarkable discovery of one of her poems. Perfect for inspiring the love of history, poetry, and archaeology in the next generation, you can find Sappho, The Lost Poetess, on Amazon. Today, I would like to talk about the lost poetess. Who is she? She is considered equal to Homer. He was the poet. She was the poetess. Plato described her as the tenth muse, which was pretty remarkable because Plato didn't even like poetry that much. And according to Solon, the, the famous Athenian lawmaker, one of the seven sages, he wished that he could be taught some of her music so that he may listen to it and then he may die. Moreover, the scholars at the Library of Alexandria enshrined her in the canon of nine lyric geniuses, the only woman to be included. So who am I talking about? The most famous lesbian in the world, Sappho. Now we say the word lesbian because she's from the island of Lesbos. And I should also say that some of those accolades could be apocryphal, but nonetheless, they really demonstrate the sheer renown and respect that Sappho enjoyed in the ancient world. So what do we know? She was probably alive from about 630 to 570 BC. She's from Mytilene, which is the capital of the island of Lesbos, hence lesbian. She's from a wealthy family, which let's be honest, all ancient females who were very educated are. She had three brothers and remember this, it will come up later. And her mother may have been called Cleos and she may have had a daughter by the same name because daughters were normally named after their grandmothers and there was a poem using this name. So this is the thought. She may have been exiled to Sicily around 600 BC for political reasons. Part of this is because there was an ancient statue of her in, in Syracuse and she was very respected over there. And we don't know much about her appearance. She's actually been described as everything from extremely beautiful to incredibly ugly. She's also been described as small and dark. So maybe that's her Sappho. Also, according to the Suda, the late 10th century Byzantine encyclopedia on the ancient world, Sappho was married to a man named Caraclos of Andros. And this was probably a joke because Caraclos is kind of derivative of a slang word that sort of suggests a male member. And Andros is just man. So you can kind of see how this is not a real name. But please do remember the Suda because this is sort of a, a very important source of biographical information about Sappho. And as we can see from the very beginning, very flawed. So her death is unknown. There was an ancient Greek comic who had a story that she killed herself by jumping off the cliffs due to her love of a fairy man. And this is something you see in literary references and it was very popular for a very long time in arts. But really, we know almost nothing. Now, I realize many of you might be thinking, this is thousands of years ago. It's hard to know stuff that happened thousands of years ago. What do you expect? How can everybody survive time? Well, this fellow did. And I'd like to talk about him for a little moment because he's very important in many ways of understanding stuff, partially because he's a contemporary. For this very first point, we see exactly how much we do know about him versus how little we know about her. So this is Alcaeus of Mytilene, and he was also a poet. You'll notice the dates are very similar to Sappho's, 621 BC to 560 BC. He was credited with inventing the archaic stanza, and he's also included in the canonical uh, libraries of nine lyric poets by the scholars of Hellenistic Alexandria. So he he knew what he was doing. And he's an older contemporary and an alleged lover of 
Sappho, whom he may have exchanged poems. Both poets composed their poetry for entertainment and their friends and their community. So they, they really had a lot of opportunities to associate with each other quite regularly. Um, and they would have definitely met at the Castilla an annual fel festival celebrating the Islands Federation at Meson, which was you know, one of the grand temples in the middle of the island. And, and Sappho always performed there publicly with a female choir. And in fact, Alcaia references Sappho in terms that are more typical for divinity, like holy, pure, honey, smiles, which is a great description. And this might have been in part because it's been inspired by her performances at the festival. So really the thought is the lesbian school of poetry reached in the songs of Sappho and Alcaeus, that high point of brilliancy, which was never afterwards approached. And maybe at this point you're saying, hey, isn't this about Sappho? I mean, we've got Alcaeus on one side, Sappho on the other, but we do learn a lot from him. As I said, there's important historical context that we can learn about Sappho too, but Alcaeus wrote a lot about the political turmoil that was happening in Lesbos at the time. It, he really colors in the world that Sappho was, was living in. And, and as you saw, the honey smiled Sappho. We get direct descriptions of her. And also, as I mentioned, it was later assumed by Greek critics that, that these two poets were in fact lovers. And this became a theme in a lot of art. It was a very popular subject. And Maybe many of you will recognize this painting. One of my favorites, we have Kaya singing beautifully to an enchanted Sappho. And of course, the question is, were they, they lovers? And one of the big reasons that people wonder were they lovers or not is because Sappho is sort of famous for her sexuality, famously controversial. From the very beginning, really, Right after her death onwards, people have been discussing her sexuality. And whether they should or not, I mean, I'm not to say, I mean, we, maybe we could just focus on the poetry, but the truth is, is that throughout her entire time period, like from now onwards, people have either been advocating that she was gay, saying that she wasn't to the other extreme, whitewashing her words, going back and forth. And in this day and age, uh, she's become a gay icon and associated with homosexuality. And from Sappho, we actually have the words lesbian and Sappho. So was she gay? Now in her own time period, she was not considered gay. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Women from Lesbos had a very different reputation for being good at things with men, in fact. And in the classical Athenian comedy, from old comedy, right up to, to Meander in the fourth and third centuries, she was really caricatured as being a promiscuous heterosexual woman. And in fact, Seca, the, the Roman philosopher and tutor to Nero, complained that a Greek scholar devoted his entire treatise to the question about whether Sappho was a prostitute. I mean, you can see people really concerned with knowing and understanding her sexuality. And in fact, some thought that they were two Sapphos, one the great poet and the other a very promiscuous woman. And in fact, there, there is an entry for each in the Suda. So at the time when Sappho's full canon was around and available, her contemporaries did not find any evidence of her being homosexual. And it wasn't until the Hellenistic period, around three centuries after her death, that she was described as such. Now, I've been using this word homosexual, you know, throwing it around, but what does that mean in the ancient world? What was gay? The concepts of homosexuality and heterosexuality, these are really modern phenomena. And uh, we, we have to always be careful when we're thinking about the ancient world to not project our own modern definitions and expectations and experiences. Homosexuality wasn't coined until 1869. So what was homosexuality like in the ancient world? Well, same-sex relations were just a lot more nuanced and involved social rank. What you did with another free citizen or with a slave, you know, different world and different positions were considered sexual or not. Um, involving particularly things like penetration. So for instance, non-penetrating female relationships were not considered homosexual. 
So the evidence for Sappho being gay, uh, the Suda, once again, refers to by names for students and female companions and it's disgraceful relationships. But these names could have also just been taken from poems. They're mentioned even in the extant fragments that we have today. So it really gets down to the poetry itself. And I don't think we can talk about Sappho without reading some of her poetry because it is just stunning, breathtaking, really. And, and in this poem from Fragment 31, which is a very popular one, she discusses uh, her love. And I'll read it to you now, so bear with me. That man seems to me to be equal to the gods, who is sitting opposite you, and hears you nearby speaking sweetly and laughing delightfully, which indeed makes my heart flutter in my breast for when I look at you, even for a short time, it is no longer possible for me to speak. But it is as if my tongue is broken, and immediately a subtle fire has run over my skin. I cannot see anything with my eyes, and my ears are buzzing. A cold sweat comes over me, trembling seizes me all over. I am paler than grass, and I seem nearly to have died. But everything must be dear dared, endured since. And unfortunately, the rest of the poem is cut off because we have this poem today because it was referenced by a much later Roman poet on a treatise on the sublime. And this was the part that he copied out to show. Clearly, he didn't like the ending, so left it out. But you see in this poem, you feel that longing, that desire. And the idea is that she's talking about this woman sitting next to this man and, and how much she wishes to be next to her instead of this fellow and um, how the effects are. But I think at this point, it's really important that we talk about modern versus ancient poetry. As I was saying before, we have to be very careful when talking about the ancient world that we don't project our modern experiences on this other period. And in the same way of different cultures, and we all experience things very differently. And, and we have to be careful that we don't just assume that things are the exact same way that they are today. When we think of modern poetry, both in its, its composition and its recital, we have visions of a person up in a loft somewhere, the rain beating in the windows, and there's, they're pouring their heart and soul into this work. They're really telling something deeply personal, deeply individual. And then it is read by another person in a deeply personal and individual way. And of course, we think of Keats and Byron and, and Tennyson and these kind of fellows. And of course, everything they write is a, a perfect truth of how they feel. But was this the case in the ancient world? Well, this is how poetry was recited. It was sung. It was a performance. The ancient world poetry was sung and danced and it was a very community-based experience. It was everyone together. Imagine you're singing this poetry with your lyre and you've got a group of friends dancing in a rhythmic beat around you. It's a very different experience. So to quote Lardinas, a Greek poetry professor, he says, that, can we really be sure these are her, when he's talking about Sappho's feelings, what is personality in such a group oriented society as ancient Greece? So we have to ask, is this poetry personal or is it a performance? And to go back to our good old Alcaeus, who can, because we have so much more information on him, show us another side of things. You look through his poetry and you see this wide variety of subjects that, that contradict themselves. For instance, there are lyrics sung in a rare meter in the voice of a distressed girl. Wretched me who shares in all these ills. We don't think that's Achaeus's voice. I mean, we know that, but he's telling stories. He's, maybe he's telling a myth or a song. I mean, we just don't know. So I think at this time, it's probably good to get into Sappho's poetry itself. Um, the reason we're talking about her. She's best known for her lyric poetry, written to be accompanied by music, as I mentioned. And ancient authors claim that she primarily wrote about love. But in fact, we found plenty of evidence to suggest that's not always been the case. There's, there's poems about family and, and aging and other uh, known love topics. She wrote her music as well as her lyrics and performed her songs in public. 
So you got to see her as more like a Joni Mitchell character. And very importantly, she wrote in the Aeolian dialect, which was very specific to certain regions in the ancient world. And that this ancient Greek was a pitch accented language, a bit like Chinese is today. So in Chinese, the tone will change the meaning of the word. So you have to follow specific tones and pitches. Otherwise, you know, you can't just follow along with the music. Otherwise, it has a different meaning. So this really is a very different effect. And anybody who's, who's spent a bit of time in Chinese opera can definitely attest to. It's something that we might not appreciate so much as English speakers. We do have it in in English, mostly to differentiate between subjects and verbs. So you can think of the word address, like what's your address or shall we address the situation? Do you enjoy the subject or was she subjected to a really fascinating webinar about Sappho? You could see how pitch can affect the meaning, but how also this is incredibly important in studying lyrical poetry of course. So Sappho is very famous for her stanza. It's a rhythmic scheme. Sappho is said to have invented called the Sack stanza. And it's a four line stanza that's consisted of three metrically identical lines of 11 syllables in length, followed by a shorter fourth line of five syllables. So the gist is three long lines followed by a short fourth line. And that is a very distinctive rhythm and pattern that is known for Sappho and it helps us identify her work. Another fun thing that Sappho does is her supra superlatives. And this is a poetic device that she used special form of hyperbole to make comparisons, which are called the supra superlatives. And here's a few examples that are some of my favorites. More golden than gold, far whiter than an egg, Hair more yellow than a torch and greener than grass. You really get that sense of extra in it, which clearly works very well. And she was prolific. She wrote around 10,000 lines. And uh, one Greek author writing centuries after her death confidently predicted that the white columns of Sophos songs will endure and will endure speaking out loud as long as our ships sailing from the Nile. So there are still ships on the Nile, but how accurate was our Greek historian? Not very accurate. Today, we only have about 650 lines that have survived. Only one poem, Ode Aphrodite, is complete. And more than half the original lines survive in 10 or more fragments. Many of the surviving fragments by Sappho only contain a single word. For example, 169a is simply the word meaning wedding gifts and survives today as part of a dictionary of rare words. So what happened? Why did they disappear? Um, according to legend, Sappho's poetry was lost because the church disapproved of her morals. And these legends appeared to have originated in the Renaissance. In circa 1550, Jerome Cardin wrote that the fourth century archbishop of Constantinople had Sappho's work publicly destroyed. And at the end of 16th century, Joseph Justice Gallander claimed that her works were born burned in 1073 by orders of Pope Gregory VII. In reality, Sappho's work was probably lost as just demand was not great. This was at a time when literature had to be copied from papyrus scrolls to codices, and it just took a lot of time and work. And if there weren't people asking for the books, they weren't going to do it. And the reason that demand probably wasn't great was the perceived obscurity of her dialect, which had many archaisms and innovations absent from other ancient dialects. So during the Roman period, the Attic dialect had become standard and readers just found Sappho's dialect difficult to understand. The way I think about it is maybe any of our Scottish fans here will know Robbie Burns. He is a famous Scottish who is beloved in Scotland. And uh, anybody who's had a good jolly Robbie Burns night can attest to that. But the thing is that it's a very strong Scottish dialect. And if you're not really familiar with the Scottish dialect, it's impossible to understand. And we still have an entire region of Scotland of people who can understand it. So you can imagine how it, it becomes less attractive to maintain or to rewrite something if people don't really understand it. The good news is that Egyptian trash has been a huge source of archaeological discovery for us. Basically what happened was these old papyrus scrolls, they, they had 
checks, tax receipts, everything written on them. And they were often recycled and compressed into cartonage material. So this stuff was used to make materials and was maintained for a very long time. And so this has resulted in these very exciting archaeological discoveries, heterological finds that are bringing just new poems to light. So in 2004, a nearly complete poem, the Teutonist poem, also known as the Old Age poem, because it discusses the deprivations of old age, was discovered. And in 2014, Dirk Obnick, a leading capitalologist of the University of Oxford, recovered substantial sections of two never-before-seen poems of Sappho, the brothers' poems, remember the brothers, and the Cracker's poem about unrequited love. And the brothers' poem is particularly exciting because it connects the two different data points. The names used in the poem refer to names also uh, referenced by Herodotus, and so and completes the, the story nicely. And new fragments continue to be discovered. And this gives us hope that this lost poetess uh, will one day be found. Piece by piece, she can return to her former glory. So I'd like to end with a poem by her. You may forget, let me tell you this. Someone in some future time will think of.